Good afternoon. This is Ed Sullivan, editor of Building Operating Management Magazine. Thank you for attending today's webcast, Data Center Consolidation, a Roadmap. Our presenter today is David Hutchison. David Hutchison is president of Excipio Consulting, LLC, a business solutions provider that empowers clients with expert, unbiased insight, enabling them to make the best possible strategies for their data center facility based on a sophisticated technical, business, and financial strategic assessment. David is a former CIO with a solid understanding of the financial impacts related to technology. David has physically completed hundreds of data center assessments in recent years for both public and private organizations ranging in size from 350 to over 100,000 employees. In addition, David also developed Excipio's data center practice and established the company's proven EAMM methodology. His credentials include over 20 years of applicable experience, Uptime Institute Data Center Certification, Project Management Certifications, and Exceptional Financial Modeling Skills. Today's learning objectives include become familiar with keys to developing a successful consolidation plan, learn how to analyze business requirements and communicate ROI and TCO benefits of consolidation to executive management, understand ways to identify the organization's IT needs and plans and how you can engage IT and finance to make decisions that will meet the needs of all groups involved in a consolidation project, and evaluate options for meeting space needs. And with that, I'll turn it over to David. Great. Thank you, Ed, um, and, and appreciate the opportunity to, to speak in front of the audience this morning. Um, we're going to move pretty quickly through some of these things, because I'm sure there'll be some good Q&A at the end of this uh, for people that will have questions. So. Uh, where we're going to start this morning is, again, kind of what drives data center consolidation. Um, every organization is different as to what is, is actually driving um, um, the root cause, whether it's financial or business, et cetera. We'll go, kind of go through those different scenarios. Um, the common question we get is, geez, it's such a huge task. Where do we start? And then also, what are the critical requirements before we go through some consolidation? So um, if you don't really have all the different aspects um, pre planned in advance, you're going to find that you're going to have outages and other problems along the way as you go. And then I obviously we'll be available at the end to do some audience Q&A. Okay? So moving forward, um, what's driving data center consolidation? Financial is one of the main reasons that we see people that are, are uh, driving towards that today. Um, IT, of course, as well as facilities, is always being asked to do more with less. And uh, Data center is one of the most expensive assets uh, to most organizations that are out there. Um, one of the other reasons we see is technology shifts. So virtualization has obviously played a huge role in that. And in, in fact, it's actually been the driving factor for many organizations. As you virtualize, you've been able to shrink your footprints from anywhere from 50 to 70 percent, which has freed up space and allowed things to be consolidated um, back to some central facilities which now is driving a lot of organizations to look at how can we reduce facilities costs, maybe shut down some locations, et cetera. Uh, another big aspect is circuit speeds. In the past, uh, your telecommunications costs have been very expensive, which is really what's led mo many organizations to use more of a decentralized model. Uh, as telecommunication costs continue to drop, you're going to see you know, it's going to become more and more viable to um, have these facilities um, you know, connected via, uh, at, a, at a central location. We were just working on a client in uh, um, a major metroplex where they had one gigabit connectivity to one of the remote locations, um, but then they could go to 10 gigabit connectivity for only about 20% more. So they could more than tenfold increase their throughput from a telecommunications perspective by only increasing the cost 20%, which actually allowed them to set, shut down some of those remote facilities. Um, and then data analytics is, is probably a huge one. Um, over time now, you're starting to get um, uh, big, big IP, big data sets, companies starting to run big data analytics, and of course all that data has to be, uh, for performance purposes, typically has to be centralized back into a, a primary facility. So it, it does make a, uh, a, a huge impact when you're trying to go through terabytes of data. Um, you know, having it in a centralized location versus multiple remote locations is, is a huge performance hit. So um, technology refresh is also a very common reason. Many organizations have not done anything to their data centers since year 2000. 
Uh, most of your electrical mechanical equipment has about a 15-year useful life. So if you would look at that, you would say that equipment, if you did something in 1999, is 14, 15 years old. So it's up for replacement refresh anyway. And so this is an opportunity for organizations to kind of get to wipe the slate clean, take advantage of some newer technologies, and uh, redesign their footprints. So, um, And then what people would think would be more prevalent uh, would be electrical mechanical issues, uh, but we don't see that being really uh, as much of a driving factor. Uh, it, don't get me wrong, it, it, it is a factor for some organizations, but the other ones that we've already discussed are, are typically more prevalent. And then kind of the last one is your kind of what's your business drivers there? And, and it could be a DR strategy, it could be you're going through mergers and acquisitions or you're divesting business units, um, or what we call the executive factor. Um, do not, we, we want to stress, you probably do not want to um, um, place a lesser value on some of those hallway conversations. Um, quite often you'll get conversations from executives that say something like, hey, I heard from my friend Bob, who's the CFO at this company, they just did this, or uh, well, I was reading on the plane, uh, you know, those types of conversations. If, if they're already starting to have that conversation with you, it means your executives are already thinking about what can we do to drive costs or to make a difference. And uh, so you want to be on the front end of that conversation where you can actually affect and have an impact with it. Okay. Next slide. Uh, so in a facilities assessment. So what goes into a facilities assessment? So the, the first thing you have to do is really understand your current state abilities. Um, so, and, and that may be what are your KW per rack, um, you know, what are the constraints that you have in your facility, are you out of power, um, you know, do you have sufficient cooling, all that. You kind of need to know where, what you already have today and what your starting point is. And then you have to look at, look at what those, uh, the risks are within that facility. So are there single points of failure, um, you know, you, you look at your electrical, whether it's your utility generator, UPS. So. Um, you're looking at, um, do you have redundant equipment? Is it single point of failure? Um, on your mechanical side, it's not just your air conditioning units. It could be your raised floor. It could be pumps. It could be fire systems. There's a variety of different things that you have with that. Um, one common question we often get is, you know, gee, well, we think we want to bring in dual utility feeds. Um, that's something where you really have to weigh the cost and the risk factors. Um, when you start looking at things like the Uptime Institute tier uh, requirements, dual utility feed is not a requirement for a tier, two, tier three facility. Um, utility power is an economic alternative, and it's actually typically much more cost effective to have a second generator to provide your backup power, your second power feed, than it is to bring in a dual utility. But every facility will have its own uh, unique aspects with that. Um, and then you want to be talking about what's, what's, what the flexibilities that you need in the data center. Um, today, what we see uh, a lot of clients struggle with is IT or facilities have to make a decision that's going to last 10 or 15 years because they're going with big iron UPS, big iron air conditioning, some of those other um, um, situations. And the reality is in today's IT world, our crystal ball just isn't that good to say what does the environment look like 10 or 15 years out. Um, so the key in your data center is really looking at your ability to scale up or down. Um, we had a client last week where, you know, they, they made the bet. They put in a 500 kW UPS 10 years ago, and today they're only using 10% of that capacity. So that means that client probably wasted $250,000 in uh, – when they could have gone with a much smaller UPS. But again, that was a decision that was made um, based on somebody's crystal ball that, that proved to be inaccurate. So um, the other thing you want is you want the ability to redeploy uh, components between sites. So let's say um, if you do a modular scalable and, and, and uh, the component modules can, can be traded, if you have the same UPS frames across two different locations, then you can actually Increase capacity at one site while decreasing capacity at another, and you're not, you already paid for that investment, so it's not costing you money to make those types of changes, um, you know, to flex with your business there. So, um, typically when we see uh, electrical mechanical um, issues, 
when it's not managed by IT, who has typically a little bit better idea of where they're headed and what the loads are going to be, um, if it's managed by facilities, we see a tendency for facility staff to overbuy. They don't do it because they don't know any better. They do it to protect themselves because um, if they don't get a clear set of requirements and they go out and spend a million dollars on whatever a generator and it turns out that it's too small, um, obviously they get political ramifications from that at some point down the road. Um, so one of the one of the advantages to doing the modular scalable again is you don't have to be as accurate about being 100% predicting the future. You just have to have the ability to expand and contract as, as necessary. So, um, and then operating costs. 80% uh, of our clients have no idea how much money they actually have invested in the current facility, and that may sound, you know, kind of crazy, but um, it, it's it's a very common problem. And, um, for example, they may not know uh, power consumption. The utility bill is often not paid by IT. It's usually paid by facilities or finance or somebody else, so they don't really understand how much power they're consuming. Uh, we actually had a client here recently where we said, hey, why are you keeping the data center at 69 degrees when you could be running at 74, 76? And the response we kind of got was, well, I prefer at that temperature when I work in there. Well, they were probably costing the company three, four hundred thousand dollars more a year by lowering the temperature that five or six degrees just so that they could feel more comfortable. It's because they didn't have any connection with the cost of what it took, uh, of what that delta differential was. So, um, risk associated with the location. Obviously, you have to look at facility, uh, regional locations, weather issues, logistics. You've got to look at regulations in some cases or disaster guidelines. Uh, one thing that we find people are often not familiar with is natural gas generators. Uh, we've had colo facilities that they're, all their generators are natural gas, but what they didn't understand is if you have, uh, like in the Midwest, we get tornadoes on a regular basis, and if you have a major um, severe damage incident, FEMA will come in and they will shut off the natural gas supply so that they protect the firefighters uh, and the emergency workers who are going in doing search and rescue. Well, if your whole backup system is built on natural gas generators, obviously that's going to be a problem for your facility going forward. Uh, and then business requirements. Um, the, the one analogy we kind of give the business people all the time is, okay, so if you owned a $500,000 house, would you spend $50,000 a year in insurance on it? Probably not. Would you spend $5,000 a year? Yes, you probably would. So, so there's some conversations you need to have with the business they talk about, okay, here's the investment we have in a data center, and here's the value it provides to the organization, and so how much money do we want to ensure um, that we, we spend on it to make sure that it's up and reliable? Um, it does cost a lot more money to chase that, all the, the final 20% to get it, um, um, you know, disaster-proof or, or highly redundant, um, but for, depending on your organization, that may or may not be worth the expenditure. So... Um, and, and the other side of it too is, you know, there's a lot of things, a lot of issues where business resources will continue to ask for more and more from IT unless they're paying for it. So if your IT organization is um, um, doesn't rebuild or doesn't at least have those cost discussions with the business, as long as it's not hitting those business units on their bottom line, it's going to be considered free. And we all know what happens when something's free. People will try and get as much of it as they can. Uh, so when people say, oh, well, we need a Tier 3 or we need a Tier 4 data center, they need to understand what that cost differential is and are they willing to, to write the check to pay for that. So, okay. Um, I think we'll move on to the next slide. Assessment components. So... Uh, obviously, there's the traditional things that everyone thinks to do in, the, in doing a, a facilities assessment, which is your physical space, your power and cooling, uh, your, obviously your connectivity options, and then the facility location risk. Um, other things that have to really be taken into account is what your IT infrastructure is going to do going forward. Um, with, with, for example, if you take some of the new uh, architectures that are in place with virtualization, you can take a blade frame that takes 16 blades in a, in a frame, uh, a chassis, 
and you can put as 20 VMs per blade, which, by the way, is a fairly low number in today's environment, um, you could literally be running 960 virtual instances in a single rack. So when you really start thinking about how much your data center could shrink if you haven't been doing a lot of virtualization, some of these IT technology standard decisions could very much have a huge impact on what the, the ongoing requirement is going to be for the business. Um, other things you have to look at are, are what are your storage growth trends. Um, while storage continues to grow, you know, um, everyone's seen the hockey stick chart, charts for most organizations. So drive, drive sizes are also getting uh, denser and denser to where you can get more and more on disk. Um, so, so you still need to be able to chart out, okay, at our current growth rate, or are we going to migrate from this application to SAP, or you know, other things like that that could have a significant difference in, in what the organization's footprint is going to look like going forward. Um, and then also, uh, again, getting back to the business requirements, there's often a significant delta between want and what they will pay for. So to give you a rough idea, uh, one of the things we would recommend you do is, is come up with a sample assessment summary. Uh, this is an example of something that we would do for a client. Uh, and your purpose here is to help them understand the relative risk within each facility. Um, it's also used as a means to compare the target facility to the current remote facilities. And then also you can use it to help prioritize uh, the order of consolidation. So in this case, uh, we use stoplight colors. So this is a, we call it a stoplight chart. Things in red fail the business requirement. Things in yellow meet, and things in green um, exceed those requirements. And so you can see for this organization, um, all, the majority of these remote facilities are actually in pretty poor shape. And then you can see the new target facility down there in the bottom. While it still has a few um, items like generator redundancy that have to be addressed, you can see that that facility meets or exceeds the business requirements in all but two categories. Uh, so this is this is an important visual that helps your will help your uh, executives understand the challenge that you're asking them to undertake. Um, visuals when you're doing this, working with your senior executives, are critical. So um, we have seen plenty of IT people that walk in with these really elaborate electrical charts and and the bits, lips, bits, bytes, all that kind of stuff. Um, and the answer is, is it usually goes right over the head. It's not saying executives aren't intelligent people because they are, but it's not focused at the level that they need to understand. Um, visuals are critical. It can really help them relate. Obviously, if you look at the two pictures on the right there, here's an example of what we have today, giving that cabling mess that's there, versus here's what we're trying to go to at the end. Um, they will gravitate towards those. those. Those images will absolutely carry a lot more weight than five or ten pages of just raw text. So, um, and again, your, your, your goal here is to help uh, compare the target facility back to the current remote facilities. Um, in this case, the circles that are there uh, in this chart, here I can kind of point those out. Um, what they're doing is, is the boxes in red are showing them, hey, the boxes in red are single points of failure. So, so they don't really need to understand the chart uh, as far as what all the breakers and those things are, but you're telling them, look at all the single points of failure we have within this, this electrical design, and then they suddenly are going to start getting it. Okay, wow, okay, we have a big problem. Okay. All right, uh, financial implications. This is one where uh, there's usually a pretty good gap between what IT uh, facilities uh, is able to provide versus what the executives are typically looking for on the business side. So, and, and, and again, you've got some pretty systemic stand, uh, issues here. IT is not accountable for all the costs, so they don't necessarily have the whole picture to put together. Um, and the other side is facilities can't account for all the IT compute load. They know what the electrical mechanical costs are, but they don't have a way to understand or predict what the compute load is or, or why this, you know, how much they need or what it's going for, uh, the target strategy looks like, et cetera. Okay. So, for example, when we're talking about IT costs, it, um, you're talking about utilities, you're talking about maintenance of mechanical electrical systems, um, you're talking about, uh, you know, we start talking about 
current state operational costs and those types of things, your goal needs to be how do we educate the executives about what we're spending today. What you're trying to do is establish a baseline that says, here's what we already spend today. Um, and and the, the main reason for that is once you establish that baseline and they understand, oh, we already have a $4 million investment today, and say you're only looking to then make an incremental $1 million investment but consolidate it and shut some things down, it helps establish their framework and their, and their point of reference for everything. Um, your current state capital, the things that you're going to need to include in that are obviously your remediation costs, like we looked at the one future target facility. It still has some things that needed to be fixed before things can move into it, so you'll have to take those into account. Um, you'll need to include any expansion costs, if there are any. You may need to expand the space or add capacity, um, as well as you may need to look at do we build new? Are we going to retrofit an existing? Are we going to do colo? Those are all other options that come into play as well. And then your future state operating costs. Quite often when you've got multiple facilities that you're consolidating down to a single one, um, the elimination of those remote facility operating costs will often pay for any changes or enhancements that need to be done to the target facility. So um, that, that's one of the reasons why you really want to make sure you capture what are all the maintenance costs, what's all the equipment costs, all the things out there at the remote site. At the end of the day, what you're really trying to do is help the CFO. You want to give him information to drive a net present value, an ROI, a payback, whatever your company's particular metrics are as they use to make those kinds of decisions. Okay, next slide. So uh, here's one of the challenges we see, again, um, you need to have the details prepared. Capital investments are, you know, are the improvements required to meet the business requirements, okay? Your operating costs uh, often increase based on the capital investments that you make. So you must be prepared to discuss the options in business terms, not technical terms. So. Uh, you, you'll have this, well, here's the list of, and you'll notice that there's several electrical and mechanical improvements here that are very detailed and don't make a whole lot of sense necessarily to an executive, but you need to have the, this level of detail prepared to have, kind of have in your back pocket when you go forward, um, but that's not the level you probably want to be presenting at. Um, you really want to probably stick with the summer concepts. So this is the same chart that's just rolled into here are probably the key six or eight things that the executive team needs to know. We need to do a UPS replacement. We need to do some electrical expansion. We need to redesign HVAC. And then we've got a contingency already built into this, just so that you know. Um, you know, there's always some gotchas as you go through these projects, et cetera. And now they're understanding um, um, where the money's going to be spent, what it's going to be spent on. Okay. And then I'll turn this back to Ed for some polling questions. All right, great. Well, thank you so much for the awesome information so far, David. It's really been a, been a great dive, and we look forward to the uh, remainder of your presentation. Ed will be back on a little bit later to uh, handle the Q&A session, but for now you'll uh, get me reading the polling questions. So uh, for all our attendees, if you could direct your attention over to the right-hand side of the screen, you should see those polls pop up momentarily. We've got four for you today, so I'll jump right in. First up, for maintenance of critical electrical equipment in your facility, which of the following resources do you use primarily? A, internal staff, B, the lowest priced service organization bidding for service on specific pieces of equipment, C, one third party service organization that maintains all of your equipment, or D, the manufacturer's field service organization. Second up, have you thought about increasing your data center's efficiency using data center modeling software and services? Are you unsure about how to get started? Three possible answers there. A, I would like some guidance. B, yes, I use or have used modeling software. Or C, no, I am gathering information at this time. If you scroll down that window, you'll see questions three and four. Third, which of the following capabilities of power quality analytics would be most valuable to you or your organization? A, have redundant networks that can self-heal if any communications issues arise. B, can capture waveforms or transient harmonics. C, acquire fast and accurate timestamps for each event. D, will transfer data at extremely high speeds and wide bandwidths. Or E, all of the above. 
Our fourth and final, how soon do you plan to start consolidating your data centers? A, we've already started. B, less than three months from now. C, between three and 12 months from now. C, or excuse me, D, beyond 12 months, or finally E, not sure or don't know. Please do take a moment to consider these questions. Select the answer that best represents you or your organization. We'll be back to the presentation shortly. Right, and it looks like we're about ready to wrap the poll up. If you didn't uh, have time to assess and, and submit all your answers there, you can feel free to chat those into us using the, uh, the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Speaking of that Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, that's where you can submit any questions you'd like David to address at the end of his prepared remarks this afternoon. I know, uh, you know we've got a, a ton of information coming up, and if you'd like any clarification as we, uh, as we move forward, just chat it in there, and we'll get to it at the end of the prepared remarks. So thank you all for your participation in this event this afternoon. We're really glad to have you on board. And uh, with that, I'll turn the microphone back over to David for the remainder of his prepared presentation. Great. Thank you, Paul. So now let's talk a little bit about critical requirements. Um, you know, th th you can see on the screen here there's an awful lot of things that need, need to be taken into, into account when you're doing a business case for, for data center consolidation. But the point of the slide is this. You know, consolidating data centers is a critical decision that, that's going to, A, create risk to your business operations during the transition. Um, it, there's, there's no way you can buy you can avoid that. It's very difficult to do. It's very expensive to make sure that you don't have no outages. So it is a risk to your business, and so you need to really plan in this level of detail to make sure it happens successfully. Um, it is going to cost money to execute. You cannot consolidate a data center uh, or, or multiple data centers without spending money. Um, it's also going to require additional resources to execute. Most of your organizations don't have excess staff sitting around waiting for projects to evolve. And um, so the, this is not something that when you, you start down this path can be done typically with part-time resources. You're typically going to need to dedicate some resources to make sure that, that things go the way they should, that people are watching all the different uh, variables to make sure that the risk and, and downtime is minimized. And you're going to have to have executive support for this. So. So in the event that you do decide you're doing some data center consolidation, you're always going to have some business unit leaders that are going to say, oh, no, we can't move now, and we can't move here, and, and they're going to kind of fight the process along the way. They may have some personal relationships with some people involved, et cetera. Your executive support is going to be paramount to making sure that you can be successful in executing the consolidation. So some key recommendations. Um, if you haven't done this to the scale being considered, get some outside help. Um, you know, there's kind of that joke about the Holiday Inn. I stayed at the Holiday Inn Express last night, and now I'm a doctor. Uh, that doesn't work with data center consolidation. Um, it, you, you definitely need to rely on people who have the battle scars and the experience who've been through this process before. Uh, do not approach this process thinking that the IT, thinking IT or CIO is the decision maker on this. Because you're going to affect business operations, this definitely needs to be a decision that's made that involves your entire executive team, not just IT, um, you know, for obvious reasons. So, um, you want to present information to the business executives, but you want to give them information so that they are making the decision on how it's going to happen. And I know that's a struggle for a lot of people from in the IT realm to go, well, wait a minute, we, we know most, we know best, et cetera, but it's all about buy-in, support, and interest. If you give them information and they make the decision, then you, IT is now executing a decision that's been made by the business executives, which has a whole different level of support and uh, you know, eliminates politics and eliminates a lot of other barriers for you to be successful. Uh, the goal is obviously, again, educating the executives so that they make the informed decision. Okay. So, um, business issues, um, one of the things you always want to, to try and focus on is there are going to be some business issues that should drive this. This shouldn't just be from a, from a, 
you know, an IT perspective. So you might have physical and logical security issues. Um, often remote sites don't have the complexity of the staff and the tools that you have at the, at the corporate headquarters or wherever your primary data center is. And so that presents a risk for your organization. Um, most organizations that have a security breach, it doesn't happen at the corporate data center. It happens at a remote site that then has access back to the corporate data center and, and those types of things. So um, you need to also have business support expectations. You know, so what are the operating hours? When will you have on-site staff? How long, if there's an outage, will it take to restore the service? You know, so what we mean by that is, for example, a remote site might only have, might have hours from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., but they've only got a single support FTE. So what do you do when that person's not on-site? Um, they might expect a four-hour RTO, but then they only have a tier one infrastructure, which is a non-redundant infrastructure. Well, if you have a non-redundant infrastructure and, and your UPS fails, um, you're probably not going to get it back online within four hours. So those are all things that have to be taken into account where the business, you, you want business to communicate their expectations. You can then give them the cost and the options, and again, they're making decisions that IT then executes. Um, and some other um, things to be aware of is it will vary greatly based on the type of organization that you are. So, for example, there's often competing business investments for those same dollars. So if you are, say, a manufacturing environment, um, your senior executives may be looking at it as, okay, we can spend $5 million to add on to our manufacturing capacity, which drives revenue, or we can spend $5 million improving the reliability or consolidating data centers. Those are the types of business decisions that they're having to look at with the company's funding. So um, quite often you get IT people that get very upset when they don't make what would necessarily be the obvious choice, when reality is the executives are looking at multiple different business decisions that need to be made, and so they're trying to figure out what they think is the best decision for the business overall. Um, also, the age of the compute infrastructure has a great deal to do with it. Are you going to be refreshing infrastructure? Are you going to be moving infrastructure, or are you just going to consolidate? So uh, that also can drive up uh, the cost significantly. If you know that your remote sites are running on servers that are seven or eight years old, you're probably not going to shut those down and move those. You're probably going to virtualize them or uh, bring up new hardware and, and migrate the instance and those types of things. So. Um, and then, and then again, reduce workloads also make the work, uh, remote work sites much more expensive to operate. So what we mean by that is a lot of people would say, well, wait a minute, a reduced workload, um, you know, consolidating more infrastructure, et cetera, um, why does that make it more expensive? Because you have to have, as you consolidate down to a smaller subset of equipment, the importance and the criticality of that becomes even more important. So now it's even more important that it doesn't go down because you don't have the load spread across five servers. Now maybe you've got it spread across three, so you've actually increased your risk, and now, you know, therefore power going out or other things like that can actually be more expensive than um, the way they operate today. So, okay. Um, so working forward from there on a data center consolidation plan, there are specific steps or phases that you would go through in, in doing a data center consolidation plan. So one is site selection, obviously. Are you going to use an existing facility, build new, co-locate, co things like that? Um, what type of staging you're going to do? You know, how many are you going to move at a time? Um, which facilities go first? All those types of things. Um, what equipment's going to be physical versus virtual moves? Um, you know, what are you going to do with your asset management systems? Um, you know, monitoring systems, other things like that. Uh, how much of it you're going to have use contractors for versus internal staff? And then you're going to have to create all sorts of, you know, schedules, et cetera, which, you know, are obviously sensitive to what the, what the drivers are for the business. So, for example, you'll rarely find that any finance organization will say you can move in the last week or the first week of the month because they're always going through the month-end close process, those types of things. Um, you need to consider disaster recovery. You need to have contingencies. What happens if we start a move and, you know, a couple of our red risk flags go up? Do we need to stop? How do we back out? Some of those types of things, as well as, as client schedules. So, 
Okay. And then uh, last is data center documentation. So um, you always want to be doing uh, your documentation. You've you got to be able to go back and do, because uh, you're going to have things that are going to go wrong. And if you've done a good job with the documentation along the way, you can do some root cause analysis. You can figure out what went wrong and why. And then you're going to use that to adjust processes going forward so that you don't have those same mistakes as you continue to do additional hardware, locations, facilities, et cetera. Um, there's a variety of things, move plan schedules, financial plans, contingency plans, all this type of stuff, that if you haven't done any of this before, um, you know, again, this is even more the reason why you would want to go out and, and leverage someone who's had experience in doing this. So. It's uh, your data center is the most expensive asset that IT typically owns, and uh, so you know it's one of those things you, you probably need to treat it as such. So, um, and that's really the, the the crux of the with the call on Ed for any uh, uh, questions that the, the audience might have. Okay, David, thank you very much for a very informative presentation. Members of the audience, now is the time to submit questions if you have them. Uh, you, can, you can send them in, and I will pass them on to David. But, David, let me, let me start with uh, this one. Um, when a, the plan is to consolidate in an existing data center, um, what are some of the key factors that the facility manager should be considering um, as as uh, he or she plans uh, to receive the the uh, the new IT equipment. Yeah, absolutely. So so that's always a challenge, right? Because you have a great baseline with your existing facility. You know what's in there, and you know what to, to expect. You've got training, you've got history, etc. Um, one of the biggest challenges, and this is where it becomes difficult for a facilities manager is, again, you don't necessarily understand what that compute load is out at those other remote facilities and what that target architecture uh, involves. So you really got to work closely with IT um, because it, otherwise you could go out there and you could go to that remote facility and you could say, oh, I can look at their UPS and they're consuming 130 kW of load. That's what I, I need to know that is coming to me. Um, but in reality, uh, IT could be using this consolidation as an initiative to go, yeah, oh, all those sites are still dedicated physical servers. We're going to virtualize 70% of those, and in reality, we're only going to move in about 30 or 40 kW of load, um, which maybe could already be accommodated by the existing infrastructure. So it's, it's important to work uh, as a team to understand what is that compute load, what is the target infrastructure, um, and then also the timing of it. Um, other things that, that come into play is, okay, great, so we're doing this consolidation, but if you also happen to know from the business side that you got a merger coming down the pipe too, what would that, you know, M&A activity could end up driving that load right back up. So um, those, those would be the main things I'd be looking for. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, David. Um, are there specific questions that uh, the facility managers should be asking IT to understand the IT compute load? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> IT, um, they can typically produce pretty easily um, an inventory of, of physical assets that are in the facility today. And you, then that is something that you can use to start um, having a conversation because you can actually go, they can look up those models, they can tell you here's what the manufacturer's ratings are. Uh, a, a great thing, a tip that I'll give a lot of people is if you go look at servers uh, and if they don't know how much power is necessarily being pulled, you can look at the power supply. So let's say it's a uh, 750 watt power supply. Most of the manufacturer servers, when, they, when it's just in normal operations mode, pull 40% of the power supply rating. So in the event that for some reason they can't estimate some of those loads that will be coming back, that's one thing you can do is go get those physical inventories, get the power supplies off of them, and then know that, you know, your actual load is going to be somewhere around 40% of that power supply rating. What you do not want to do, and we have seen some fairly sizable uh, public sector organizations make this mistake over and over, is let's say you've got 30 remote facilities out there, and what they do is they call them up and they say, so we're going to do data center consolidation. How much space do you need? 
and the facility manager there says, well, our data center is 4,000 square feet. And they say, great, and they add it all up, et cetera. Um, we had a client that, that took that approach. They actually built, because when they added in everybody's uh, space requirements, they came up to 60,000 square feet of race floor space. They built a building that was capable of supporting 60,000 square feet. And in actuality, once you go through virtualization, consolidation, and things like that, they could have gotten by with 15,000 square feet for the next 20 years. So obviously that's a sizable miss um, and overinvestment in infrastructure and other things like that um, by, by taking the wrong approach. Okay, uh, thanks, David. So to determine the capacity of a data center, a facility manager really has to go to the IT person and ask very specifically about what the, the loads of the IT equipment are. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, and, and, and where it's going. Um, so say, for example, you know, um, say you decide you're suddenly going to implement SAP, um, I would, you know, that's a pretty sizable investment, and typically when that happens, the number of servers and the amount of storage is going to grow pretty significantly. So therefore, you, they can actually help you predict or project how much, um, you know, additional power and capacity is going to be required. Okay, so it's really a conversation with IT uh, that has to take place on, on a number of subjects. Yeah, it's definitely hand in hand. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, in terms of looking down the road, um, how far out can IT typically forecast, uh, you know, in terms of future uh, compute load, and, and how, how accurate would they typically be, do you think? Yeah, this is a great challenge. That's a great question because th this is a challenge. Facility managers are used to doing projections that are, you know, 15, 20 years down the road. Um, in reality, as we all know, IT, your crystal ball, once you get out the past three years, gets really fuzzy, and to try and even project anything past five years is almost kind of a, an exercise in futility. Uh, if you look back, for example, five years ago, server virtualization was in its infancy. And you know who would have ever who would have ever thought five years ago that you'd be where you are today in terms of the, the shrunk footprints and the amount of virtualization implementation that's out there. So um, now, which which really only emphasizes even more so why modular, scalable, um, you know, cookie cutter um, designs are uh, more desirable. You don't have to go build out, you know. 800 kW at one time, you could des decide that you're going to build um, your data center out in three phases, and maybe each phase each phase is 300 kW, and it's got its own generator, UPS, et cetera, and then you have a cookie cutter, and you know exactly what it costs, and you're just going to replicate it again when you need to add capacity. Okay. Uh, thanks, David. Um, a question along those lines. Do pod deployed data centers provide sufficient flexibility and scalability? Um, here's the challenge with, with pods. Um, they, they are flexible, they are scalable, but here's where they, they, most people really get the big value from. Um, the people that employ pods have the luxury of all of the, all of the equipment in there is extremely, is highly standardized. So for example, if you walk into a Microsoft or a Google, you know, location where they've actually done pods, you can walk in there and everything in that, that pod is exactly the same model. It's got the same specification, configuration, et cetera, and um, they can do huge workloads with it. And um, when, when a device goes bad, they just turn it off. And when they have a certain failure rate in the pod, then they just take the whole pod offline, and then they retrofit it and bring it back. Um, if, if you don't have those types of standardized configurations, standardized workloads, pods tend to be a little more problematic um, to um, maintain consistency in, in terms of power cooling, et cetera. So um, the people we've seen be more successful with those are those that can, more, that can use highly standardized environments. Okay. All right. Thanks, David. Uh, members of the audience, uh, if there are any other questions, now is the time to submit them. Um, we, we've uh, we've covered the questions that have come in so far, so I'll give you uh, half a minute to get in any last minute questions. Um, okay. Well, uh, 
David, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Uh, and, and members of the audience, thank you for joining us today. Um, and with that, I will conclude our webcast. All right. Thank you very much.